Hello, everybody. It's Dean here, and I'm back for another episode of the podcast. And I have Richard Pakey from Lime Licensing Group. Richard, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Dean. Pleasure to see you. So as people will know, I don't prep for these. We literally have a conversation. So Richard has pretty much no idea what I'm going to say. And I think it makes for a more interesting conversation. And Richard, we'll, we'll edit out. If you have a Gerald Ratner moment, we will edit it out. Don't worry. I'll do my so, best. Richard, do you want to just tell us a little bit about what you do and what you're about? Yeah, happy to do so. And thanks again, Dean. And um, so I'm the managing director of Lime Licensing Group. And I think you'd really engage with us for two reasons. I think if you're looking to uh, expand and grow a business, you'd come to us to help you franchise your business. So I think uh, we largely deal with business owners on helping them with a growth strategy. And then if you flip the coin a little bit, on the other side, when those businesses are franchised, we'll deal with uh, individuals that are looking to buy a franchise and get into a business for the very first time that actually they might not necessarily realize it's a franchise they're looking for, but they'll respond to some marketing, we'll pick it up, and we'll talk to them about having their own business uh, via a franchise. Mm -hmm. So it's very two clear and distinct routes that we can help businesses and individuals with. So so when somebody's looking at, you know, scaling a business, obviously we come we come at it from two different sides in one sense. You you come at it from how can we multiply this business and mobilize more people in this business and i'm i do it from a let's get you in front of more customers mm. kind of thing but the fundamental principle is the same you're helping a business scale just using a different model yeah what are the telltale signs that a business can franchise yeah i think that's re it's a really good question and uh, you know i've been thinking about how best to answer questions like this and you know i think lots of people do lots of things in different ways don't they but i think from our point of view we say the best way to approach and to franchise a business is something that you can prove works so if you like the number one criteria for us is you have got to have proven it you've got to have that business already running already operational you've got to know the ins and outs of that business you know the highs and the lows and i think from us from a, a standing start, that's the first thing we look at because ultimately down the line, you've got to look somebody in the eye and say to them or make them believe that you know everything there is to know about this business. And we personally believe that only comes from firsthand experience. So if you like, what, what we personally don't like to franchise are somebody's ideas and i know people can be very ambitious about something they've spent loads of money on developing and maybe r d and other things but we still say first and foremost prove it first mm -hmm. okay so i think that's probably the first thing we would look at you know is it already established is it proven and really it needs to be profitable so mm -hmm. you know you know businesses can be well run and not necessarily profitable but i think for us again We've got to look somebody in the eye and say, you will make money out of buying this because, again, the founder's already done it in a different location and you're really replicating what's already working for them. So I think first and foremost, I think the two things we're looking for there, if we can tick both of those boxes for sure, then I think really we've got a fighting chance. Mm -hmm. I think I think there are other elements, but I think they would be the first couple of things that we would look at. And and have you got exact because obviously we live in a digital age and some people would say, uh, and I'm just being devil's advocate, do you need a franchise in this day and age, given that you can go on the Internet and build something from scratch yourself? Well, you know, weirdly, I think, um, you know, this is a really crucial point, and I think. I personally believe, and I've written articles to say, you either buy a franchise or you don't. So you either buy a franchise or you start an independent business. And there are very clear differences that, you know, a franchise really has taken a proven format and it's following that proven format. And to a degree, you haven't, or you won't really get the flexibility to try new things because of course the franchisor, the owner mm -hmm. of the brand, 
wants you to follow what they've already proven is uh, does work. So I think some people want the reassurance that the things that they're going to be doing are the things that they know work well. And so in, on one hand, if you're not uh, thinking that that's what you'd like to do, you definitely shouldn't be looking to buy a franchise. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, maybe independent businesses are right for some people. And I, I, I must admit, even sitting here now saying this might come across as a bit odd as a franchise consultant to say that for some people franchising isn't going to be right but i've had the example over the last couple of days you know i'm picking up on detail they're saying to me that actually they want flexibility they want to try new things and that's definitely not what franchising is about so mm -hmm. you know again we can lean one way or the other depending on what it is that ultimately people want to do themselves it's a bit like, um, you know, McDonald's is one of the most famous franchises. Yeah, there's a set menu, there's a set style, there's a set format, and it's and it works. And that's why people pay money to buy it, because it's a business in a box. I know it's not in a box. It comes on the back of a lorry at McDonald's. But, yeah, does, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but it's a business in a box. So, you know, the guesswork, the processes, the, the all of that kind of stuff. It makes sense if somebody wants their own business. But our franchises, because obviously, you know, I think of franchises as, oh, you can buy a location. Are, are there any examples of franchises where it's not a location? Yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, I think uh, what, what you're really referring to is what we call a bricks and mortar franchise. So, you know, that that McDonald's, I'm I'm near to Cambridge. So that McDonald's in, in Cambridge is, you know, your franchise in a given location, you're operating from that premises. But, you know, that's just one type of franchise. And I think property franchises are by far one of the single biggest uh, mm -hmm. franchises in the franchise world. But, you know, we're in an era now where, you know, people have got used to working from home, haven't they? Mm -hmm. You know, working from maybe their, their laptop or, on on a phone and, or or maybe just meeting people you know going back to doing face-to-face uh, -face meetings uh, which is a uh, uh, highly welcome now and you know there are franchises that are just like this they're exactly that they're working from home on your laptop you know we can think about you know maybe some uh very simply um car leasing there's actually car leasing franchises and again you with a laptop and a phone you're orchestrating deals to become a third party but again, there'll be a franchisor that's trained you on how to find the people that are looking for the deals, how to deal with those people to help them buy. And then ultimately you're earning a fee on the business that you generate. So, you know, that can literally be as simple as that. And, and in fact, anything in between. Wow. So, so we, we were in kind of a space where post pandemic, some people have gone, do you know what? I don't want to do the corporate life anymore. Is that a lot of what you're seeing? People are going, do you know what? I'm, I'm, I want a simpler way of life. I want to do my own, do it my own way, carve my own path, but I want some degree of surety around income. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly that. And I think what you've always, what we've always found in franchising for us anyway, is whenever there's any economic reset, franchising always does really well so you know we talk about the things that have happened recently you know we can talk about brexit we mm -hmm. can talk about pandemic you know we're talking our way into a recession but i suppose the numbers don't lie do they and i think it it looks like we're heading that way mm -hmm. and and you know weirdly franchising bounces back very strongly from that because if you like you've got two camps you've got a, a business camp that actually they need to flip they need to think right we can't keep doing what we've been doing and food and beverage uh franchises were a really good example of this during the pandemic all of a sudden they couldn't open well they're not going to survive if they can't open so they thought well what can we do to be able to survive mm -hmm. so they relied purely on delivery i mean and we were all doing it weren't we we were stuck at yeah. home the, the only luxury item we could probably have was food. And if you look at me, you can see I was probably party to it. So all of a sudden, you know, we're on Just Eats and Uber and all the other delivery aggregators. So they flipped that model that was largely based on footfall to be an all of a sudden delivery. 
But then on the other side, you know, you've got those individuals, you know, like like me, I was into this before uh, the pandemic, but like me, where, you know, they've had a quite a comfortable corporate life and everything that comes with that. So, you know, long hours and, you know, now they're restricted. But, you know, life at home looked very different, didn't it? You know, all mm-hmm. of a sudden, you know, can't go and do uh, meetings. You know, you can't be traveling around. But I'm realizing now as a life at home means that actually that feeds into franchising very, very well. You've got some really highly skilled people and, and unskilled as well. I'm not saying it's the necessarily one target group who realize there's life other than work and now want to take better control of what they've enjoyed during the pandemic. And again, they've slotted into franchising by making an inquiry on a home based franchise, for example. Uh, and uh, and we're definitely seeing uh, these types of people morphing into franchising on that basis. And then I'm talking like, you know, hundreds a month, not the odd one here and there, hundreds of people a month. To give you an idea, we've probably talked to a thousand to maybe twelve hundred people a month. And a significant proportion of those people right now are exactly as you describe. They've had that background and, and, and lifestyle. And now it's they just want a complete sea change. Mm. it's so, it's um it's it's basically i mean the i think you know i don't want to diss corporate jobs um but i think it's easy to feel you know we can earn good money you can earn good money in corporate i've done some work consulting work in the corporate world and you can earn really good money mm-hmm. but sometimes you get to a point where it doesn't feel like it means anything you have to have a life, don't you? And I think, you know, we, we've all been now. I I wouldn't say I necessarily I was out and out corporate, but I've had that life where, you know, the things that I needed to do are dictated to, the locations that I need to go to are dictated to, the people I meet are dictated to. And yes, you have a degree of that in franchising, but all of a sudden there's an opportunity to still earn a decent income. Mm-hmm. But, you know, now because of the pandemic, like you say, we've realised that actually – it's not all about work. It can't be all about growth. You know, there is life after work. There is a family life. And actually, where is that happy balance? Mm. And, you know, you can take a drop in earnings to have a better home life. And, you know, some people will earn a lot more. Some people will earn a lot less. But do you know what? I think personally that franchising just gives people options. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what this target group are looking for. They're just looking at if I've been so one-sided in the past and I've become so blinkered is franchising just an environment to give me that option you know they might want to be more have more home life they want money they might want to do more hobbies or other things but it's just creating options and i think again it's just where franchising slots very very nicely into that now that's not saying dean by the way that a franchise means that you know you literally you open the door tomorrow and there's a load of things that are done centrally for you and just sit and wait for things to happen mm-hmm. As we know, don't we? Running a business is significantly more challenging than that. But you know what? You're starting with, again, stuff and a library of things that, again, you're just being told, you know, look, follow this first. Be more ambitious later. Mm -hmm. But you're not starting with nothing. You're starting with something which, again, they're used to that in in that corporate environment. So, again, franchising can follow that quite quite well. Yeah. I mean, when I started, obviously, my business was not a franchise. But it took me a few years to figure everything out. Yeah, it's a really key message, you know, when we're talking to franchisees and helping them to understand why you would pay a franchise fee. And I say I say this to the entrepreneurial type. I say, look, in fact, I say this to business owners as well. I say, you know, if you had your time again, so let's go back 10, 20 years, depends on how long they've been in business. If you knew what you knew today, <laughs> but you could have gone back in 10 or 20 years and, you know, you'd figured all that out. And, you know, would you be prepared to pay somebody for the privilege of what you know today, but got to know that 10 or 20 years ago? And I can tell you some of the figures you now when I say, well, what would that be worth to you now, knowing what you know now, but applying that to 10 or 20 years ago? Some people to me have said hundreds of thousands of pounds. Yeah. You know, that's the money they've invested lost made a mistake on you know we've all got business scars haven't we yeah but actually when you put this into a monetary value and i say well look actually the the purple patch in franchising for that knowledge 
it's probably somewhere between 10 to 20k mm -hmm. so that's 10 to 20k of just finding out the good stuff and yeah. for, forgetting all the bad stuff well i know i'd pay 10 to 20k i mean i did it i i was a franchisee myself before um, i took over the reins and became the managing director of lime licensing group so i've, I've been there myself i know exactly what i would do again and not do yeah I mean, if i the, the one big kick that i had was um when i did some big consultancy gigs i dropped some of my social media channels so so i kept obviously linkedin and built linkedin but i dropped some of the others and i think oh, i would have absolutely nailed i would have been a multi-millionaire um probably three four years ago if i'd have held on to those channels and i just didn't and it kick you kick yourself because you wish you could go back but just just talking about i want to kind of pivot a minute from you know the jobs market's been pretty crazy right now it's still upside down where there's there's more jobs than people but without going doom and gloom we're seeing like the um you know the recession the signs of a recession what's your take on where the jobs world's going to go with a recession and all of that stuff do you think it's going to kind of come back to normal or is it going to hold out the way it is well i suppose i can only really give you first hand experience of what the franchisors that i'm representing are saying to me uh, because of course you know the employment side isn't you know we're not involved operationally so you know mm. we hear this you know not third hand but you know we, we, it just so happens we do deal with a lot of food and beverage franchisors so they've been massively impacted by brexit especially mm -hmm. and by the talk of recession and i think you know for sure they're having to pay now uh proper rates and of course there's minimum wage guarantees anyway isn't there but mm -hmm. you know that that's always been there but now it's at a heightened level and i think you know for me when they can start to talk a story and you know they can they can they can get onto people and um form an emotional attachment and you know with other incentives that they can offer them they don't seem to be struggling with recruitment and i'll give you an example the irish market is very very difficult we've got one particular food and beverage uh, uh franchisor and he, he was constantly told you won't find staff in ireland in food and beverage and he put out a very simple advert uh, you know on a very popular um uh, employment site and he had in excess of 200 applicants Wow. you know when he was being told you know it, it's it's a really challenging marketplace and it is uh, and i think the reason he did that was because you know it's a new fairly fresh brand and he told that story that actually this is what we want to do in the market this is who we want to attract and why and can you see it's a story that they started to believe in and and i have to say he got some very very high caliber applicants that business is now off the ground with the right number of staff so i think probably going back to the question is it just depends doesn't it it just depends on you know have you moved forwards you know are you static or are you showing some progression of something new and different and i think that's what will attract people to that thing so i think again you know if we're all going to move forwards in a right and positive manner i think this will be fine we'll ride this out you know it's mm -hmm. still going to be a challenge short to midterm but I think long term it will bounce back and I think it'll actually bounce back even stronger. You know, we've got, you know, one of the best economies in the world. We've got mm -hmm. some of the best businesses, homegrown businesses. You know, you can't stay deflated for too long. So, you know, I, I, you know, I have to be optimistic in this role. But I think genuinely as well, I think, you know, you know, we've got a dip. You know, business is about the peaks and troughs, isn't it? We're mm -hmm. just in this dip at the moment. I think we are talking ourselves into it, mind. Mm -hmm. But I think it, I think personally, it's going to come back stronger than ever, and franchising will do as well. Well, I think I think you know. I mean, the way I the way I think about inflation, and this might seem a bit silly because everybody's a bit frightened about inflation, and it is painful right now. I you know I filled up yesterday, and it was painful to see see how little you got for your money. Yeah. Um, but one of the things is it's an adjustment isn't it yeah it's a you know they call it you know clever people call it a market correction yeah but effectively you know if things all go up by 11 percent, 
next year they don't go up by 11% again because if they stabilize it, it's zero we've we've adjusted it's over it's done with everything corrects itself but one of the one i think i think you're right we are talking ourselves into a problem because as soon as people get frightened they stop spending and that kind of works its way around i think dean you know I think we forget, you know, because this is, if you like, it's a usual sort of 10 year cyclical event, isn't it? And I think we'd had so many years of it just being quite stable and static and low mm -hmm. that we'd sort of got used to that being being the norm. And, you know, I, I wasn't, uh, you know, I was too young to remember, you know, when inflation was 13, 14, 15 percent. But of course, I've, I've I've heard all about it from, mm -hmm. you know, from colleagues. And, you know, we're not an age where you know we can readily remember that and understand the impact of it but you know things were historically low for so long that became the norm mm -hmm. because actually you know even where we are now in the grand scheme of things it's you know and i i know this is a pressure for some people and it's significant but you know we're not at the peaks of where where this could or did go many many years ago so mm -hmm. i think you know like you say there has been an adjustment I think it was probably long overdue, but again, I think businesses now just need to pivot and adapt to that. You know, they know it's there. They know what that outcome is going to be. So, you know, we've got to flip some models and, you know, seriously look at other growth strategies and be clever at other things, which again is, is, is your bag uh, thing. So, you know, I think it, sitting still does nothing for nobody, does it? No, but I think, I think we do like to get into a predictable pattern. And when that predictable pattern changes, we don't like to change it. No, but, you know, we also deal with a lot of investor types. So, you know, this isn't um, what we call in our world a single unit owner operator franchise. You know, these are guys that will typically be live offshore. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got significant sums to invest. And, you know, they're looking at events like this where, some people will think they need to scale back and if you like their business becomes devalued because they're affecting the growth of it and i'm not kidding you these guys are sitting there looking at those businesses and thinking i can probably pick up some bargains right now and you know i have you know again not very very regular but i have enough good conversations with groups like this that are just saying you know the uk as a rule is stable the uk as a rule does get growth you know, it's an attractive environment to be in. Let me tell you, there's no shortage of money out there. It's just that some of us haven't got enough of it yet, but there's plenty out there. Yeah, uh, it's it's um when when you see it in that sense, I think as well. Sometimes, from a business point of view, we can say, "Oh, look what's happening in the economy." Obviously, people don't have the money to spend. But for every person that isn't to spend able to spend money, there's somebody who is. And this is what I think we don't get. You know, in the pandemic, we saw the hospitality sector really suffer. And it was horrific. Loads of people lost their livelihoods. And, and you know, that's sad. But you also saw the other industries that absolutely boomed. And I think even, you know, in lots of different franchise worlds, there are people who will win and people will lose from everything that's why governments can never please everybody because there's always a loser and there's yeah. always a winner i think dean you know i think we've also we needed to be minded that you know there are people hurting right now aren't there mm -hmm. i think you know when you see the rise of the food banks i think is a complete travesty you know i've been in plenty of cities you know since things opened up and i've seen the amount of homelessness which i have to say still shocks me to the core I, I i i can't quite believe it personally but you know maybe i'm just a bit blinkered but you know so there are lots of people suffering but like you say on the flip side of that you know there are there are actually individuals individuals and businesses doing very very well um and again they have pivoted uh, and adapted and you know they're, they're actually looking at the future as being very very bright they think that you know we've had the worst of it over the last few years and mm -hmm. they see it that actually you know there's the potential for the next seven to eight years of of really boom time so you know you know and i think you know we'll get companies like ours and yours that are trying to do things to make a difference mm 
Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, we've we've also got to be minded of that, that we need to give back as well. So, you know, I think if we if we all collectively do that, then I think we've got half a chance, haven't we? You know, yeah. we'll certainly do our best to do the things right, won't we? Yeah. So so um, you're you're working on both sides of the fence in terms of matching people who are thinking about franchise or people who want to start a business making sure that they're the right fit and they find the right fit. So you don't end up with somebody who wants to innovate yeah. a model. In fact, you, you've used your words really nicely there, Dan. I wish, uh, I wish I'd wish i used that. But the finding the right fit is just so critical. And I think this is – I think you get some people that just think anybody can buy a franchise. Um, and, you know, actually the franchisors equally want the right fit, you know. And I think deals only ever get done if there is the right fit all around. So we sit on that fence to make sure we're representing the franchisor and the brand correctly and we're finding the right fit for them but you know they understand that you know with us being so experienced and knowledgeable in this space for the time frame we have we'll never do it to the detriment of the franchisee so again mm -hmm. we look after the franchisee and say you know look we need to understand what it is that you're looking for in your target investment level and you know we'll position everything to you so you fully understand this franchise to make sure it's the right fit for you so I think we generally come across as a third party consultancy firm. But, you know, we always say, look, we are representing this particular brand. That's why we're able to share the commercially sensitive information with you. But I, I just realized I didn't quite answer probably a part of your last question. And that is that actually right now the government want more people out of employment into self-employment. So would you believe that there's even schemes right now in the UK that helps them to buy a franchise. It's not a grant, it's it's a loan, but it's a loan where the bar sets so low, you know, pretty much as long as you can prove who you say you are, you, you're probably going to get some significant funding towards buying a franchise. So again, there's probably never been a better time than now to explore how, buying a how, franchise. How does that work? That that kind of franchise financing? Well, it's it's a government initiative. It's actually nothing to do with uh, with Lyme. But um, again, if you can prove who you are, who you say you are, and then you know the detail behind the scenes are that the franchisors already work with that institution to prove that you know they're a credible business and they're profitable, and they can just replicate this in another location. So that entity understands the business setup. And then it's just literally an exchange of information. And as long as they fit the criteria and they've got a bank account, they're going to get uh, available funding to help them buy it. Because, again, the criteria there is we want more people out of employment into self-employment. Uh, funding's often one of the biggest barriers, if not the biggest barrier. So here's the facility to help you through that process. It's a very, very quick and easy process to go through. Wow. So, I mean, it seems like it seems like it's the win win. Who would you who would you say are the uh, other than the innovators? Who would you say are the who who would you say the real good fit and bad fit types? If there are types, yeah, of of franchisees, Dean. Yeah, franchisees. Um. Well, I think. We're quite unique in some respects because we get into a position where we're only ever dealing with people that have sort of already put their hands up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll place some marketing on a particular brand and brands and they have to have already seen that. So, you know, from our point of view, we know that these people have got an interest in franchising full stop. And then by and large, they've got an interest in a particular brand or brands. So if you like, we're, we're sort of halfway there, but it is fair to say. That it's not necessarily the right thing for them, so it might be. Because what they thought the franchise was, it, it, it wasn't exactly as they thought it was going to be. Um, so I, I think the, the right fit is people that are already thinking about franchising. OK or buying a mm -hmm. franchise i think the the probably the worst fit is you know we're trying to shove franchising onto them 
Um, so, yeah. you know, they'll often not know about franchising. They certainly won't understand it. They don't see a reason to um, invest upfront capital to buy a franchise, to buy a license. You know, they don't see that um, it needs additional investment because ultimately it's still their business. It's, mm -hmm. it's their own independent business that, you know, they're just following a system to roll that out. So I think there's, can you see there's lots of elements there that have still got to stack up for everybody to make mm -hmm. this viable and work all around. So, you know, it, there's actually a much longer answer to probably what's quite a short <laughs> question there. <laughs> no, but you, said, you said something interesting there, Richard, about, you know, like I can walk you through how my business works, but actually templating it almost, that must take some work to figure that out. Like I can yeah. tell you, you know what I mean? I, I'm yeah. thinking about it and going, yeah, I can tell you how everything works, but actually putting it into something else, somebody else, you know, almost like imagine all of, I have to, you know, take this business and start it again with brand new people. Yeah. There's a lot of kind of knowledge that's not written down. That is almost like it's there, but the spirit of it isn't there. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And in fact, this is again, one of the things that we talk about to franchisors or at that stage, business owners, you know, we'll often say, look, we don't know about your business only you know about your business and our challenge is how can we get the things out of their head that only they know mm -hmm. you know and like you say some of those things that, you, that they cut the, there isn't a crossover to putting that down on a piece of paper to help somebody understand it but i say look you know your business we're not ever pretending we know it but you know what we do know is how you go about franchising a business and it can be as little as there's 40 different elements to pull that information out. Now, one of those 40 is the operation side. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, now operations, as we both know, that can run into thousands and thousands of pages if you let it. But again, you, you just mentioned the word there, spirit of mm -hmm. it. And I think that's critical as well. And again, the right fit is understanding that actually there's some things that, you know what? You just can't learn from just reading about it. It doesn't exist. It's not a thing. But again, you work together as a partnership. So mm -hmm. it's not a franchise or a franchisee relationship. It is legally, but actually it's a partnership and understanding that there are some elements that just need a bit more holding your hand on. And, you mm -hmm. know, this is where I think franchising, again, falls into its own because the support structure of any business but certainly in franchising is critical and some people just want that additional support to make sure they're doing the things right and that sometimes means letting them do it incorrectly as long as it's not going to impact on the business but but you're absolutely right there's some elements that are very difficult to you know put into content but you know we need to as much as we can because what we're trying to do is protect that franchise or or business owner that you know look if horrible thing to say but if they went under a bus tomorrow that business can still continue in lots of different mm -hmm. locations so you know there is an element of we do need to understand warts and all all the nuts and bolts to put this into some sort of system for other people to just read and and replicate mm. so uh, you see um just out of curiosity i don't know whether you know this and we'll, we'll kind of what's what's the growth trajectory of franchising been because some people might see it as you know the mcdonald's things and then other people might see it as little solopreneur like avon things which is not really franchising or would you categorize the kind of avon world as franchising or not well well i suppose if you were to sum up franchising i mean i i don't use technical jargon because people don't understand technical jargon but you know franchising as in its simplest form it's this it's it's a historic business so it's established that's operating well and ideally profitable uh, but it's limited by its location whether it's a fixed location bricks and mortar or whether it's an online presence but it's got a limitation somehow that if we were to literally take that if you like business in a box 
and replicate in a different part of the country or in somebody else's bedroom or wherever it might be, it, it can be replicated. So, you know, in its simplest form, that's really all it is. Mm -hmm. And I think for, for a business owner, it's just another way to grow a business. And I think, you know, probably a topic for another day is how you can exit a franchised business far better than you probably could do standalone. And as a franchisee, it's just a way of buying into that business and having a ready-made business good to go. You know, I wouldn't say tomorrow, but you know, within within weeks, and not having to create those individual steps again. So mm -hmm. in its simplest form, that's as simple as it gets. So you know, it's whatever business get, businesses can fit into that. Like mm -hmm. you say, it could be the businesses that you've you've, you've given examples of there, um, or the McDonald's. I think you know. I think there's a misunderstanding about franchising. And I think if you just think about your local town, right, there's going to be some people that you're probably, you're just familiar with because you see them regularly. And, uh, you know, I mean, we'll give you an example of maybe a coffee shop. And mm -hmm. you see that person working in that coffee shop. And I think some people just make an assumption that because it's a big brand, that mm -hmm. that person that they know just works for that big brand. And I think that they don't probably appreciate that sometimes that actually that person that's working in there actually just owns that license. Actually, that premises is there. Yeah, it's, a lot of coffee shops are franchises, aren't they? Massively so, yeah. Uh, although we need more, by the way. Um, uh, but, but so, you know, you think that's still a local person operating at a local level, employing local people, it's mm -hmm. just they're doing it under the banner of a big brand, a big franchised brand. Now, mm -hmm. of course, everybody knows McDonald's. And I think if you ever asked anybody, you know, give us uh, an ex uh, two brands that you know about, about in uh, franchise, you know, they might say KFC and McDonald's. But, you know, it might just be that that business that you see that you go and order your coffee from or you go and order your sandwich from, they're not the big brands that you, you expect to see. Mm -hmm. They could still well be a franchised entity. It's just that you've not been in enough towns to see them in, you know, the next biggest town or city. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, I think I think franchising just has this this inherent problem. There's a lack of understanding of it and who it can be and who works in there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, very so, much. You're just seeing the local local level side of it, aren't you? Just just then just so that we can kind of fully dispel this myth. We, we see the McDonald's as a franchise. What other big names on the high street would you, uh, or big names would you know that operate franchising? Um, as as in the big brands that everybody would. Yeah, uh, yeah, the main na names that we know, like. Well, the biggest are Subways by far. You know? Subways franchise, not all yeah. of it. They've got their own stores and. Sub yeah, but you, as well. you know they're at 40, 43,000 units um, uh, around the world. Wow. Um, but you know some franchises could be five. 10 30 units 100 units it's just oh. that you know you probably just haven't got them in your local um village or town or, yeah. or city um so you know and some franchises only want to be that sort of size you know they don't necessarily want to be nationwide or or maybe the business sector means that they don't need to be running at hundreds of units so you know again as long as they fit that criteria that you know they're an established business they're profitable and they just need to pick that up in another location. That location might be countrywide. Mm -hmm. You might have literally one person that's running the UK side. And yeah. then, you know, it's only big enough for it to be a countrywide franchise. So, you know, your next stop would be France or Spain or Italy or Australia, wherever it might be. Yeah. It's funny, actually, now that you mention it, I know that this, there's a shop down here in Plymouth and Cornwall. Uh, they sell cornish made produce and actually their franchises there's about 13 or 14 of them yeah and i've just realized yeah they're all franchises because you see like every so often you'll see uh, a store opportunities in some of the windows not all of them yeah and it's like oh and then you suddenly realize oh the the, the problem is there's small businesses hiding behind a big brand or oh, what you'll get often is as well you'll get companies like that that if you like they have a they have a corporate structure so you know they might have opened up 10 sites in different locations and you know and they'll come to me and they'll say look we've got 10 company owned sites 
um, do you think we could fantasize? And I, and I sit there thinking, oh, my word, I can't believe you're even asking me that question because you've just proven you can take that model, roll it out to a different county or village or town or city. Um, that's exactly what a franchise is. It's just that actually they've grown probably internally, you know, with using company funds. Mm -hmm. And they've just, again, they've not trodden the franchising path. But what's quite exciting for them is they can continue doing that, that, that corporate growth. You know, they, you know, if there's certain locations, you know, like you mentioned, maybe in the South, you know, you know, they just want to have more locations close to them. They can continue with the company growth, but yeah. actually they might decide, actually we see Manchester or Liverpool as another way to grow. And it might just be too far apart for them to have a company owned site. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly the reason why they would franchise. I was thinking as well, I mean, I'm, I might be making sweeping judgments here, so feel free to kind of avoid the question. Um, oh, well. <laughs> do you think the other thing is from a business's point of view, if they've got somebody who's invested in the success of that location, like if you put a manager in, I'm not, I'm not criticizing employees. So do, but if you've got somebody whose livelihood is built off the success of that store and they know they're responsible, that's their baby, they're going to fight to make it successful. Yeah. Do you know, it's really important. You know, you want invested people, you know, I think a common question is why should I be paying an initial fee and why should I be paying ongoing fees? And, you know, it's partly deliberate. It, you know, it's often actually the cost that the franchisor incurs to onboard you as a franchisee. So, you know, they don't want your initial fee, but they've got to put something in place to say, we need to make sure this person's really serious. And to do that, whether we like it or not, they've got to hurt you in your pocket. Mm -hmm. They've got to hit you in your pocket. So, you know, you've got an attachment monetary wise. Now they want you to make an, an emotional attachment as well. And it's actually the combination of that two that they know, you know, they're giving you all the reasons to get out of bed and, you know, and, and make that business work and go that extra mile. And again, it's all those things that they're looking for. You know, it's not orchestrated to do anything other than make sure you're absolutely the right fit. And we keep talking about the right fit, don't we? Yeah. So, you know, again, these are the barriers they put in place. You know, you know, I've got examples in the past of where I've seen some brands launch at low fee or zero fee. But can you see how? They've not hurt that person. You know, they've made it too easy to get into. And the problem is too easy to get in means it's probably too easy to get out. Mm -hmm. And you're right. They're, they're not fully invested. And it's a big mistake that franchisors make. You know, cover your costs. You know, make sure it's the right fit. Make sure everybody wins out of it. And then, you know, you've got a, a, a very good chance. And the stats are being that actually... And this is a, a, a NatWest stat, so, you know, it's a credible stat that 97% um, of franchises operate well. And, you know, the definition of that is, you know, it's not quite clarified, but, you know, you compare that to standalone businesses and the failure rate of mm -hmm. standalone businesses and nothing can get anywhere near what franchising can do. So, you know, again, it's another significant reason to look into franchising but again not saying it's for everybody i'm never saying that no because if you if you want the entrepreneurial journey that kind of adventure of finding and creating something yourself that could a franchise could be like a job for you yeah but likewise if you've come from that corporate world and you go do you know what i like the structure i like the fact that i'm not having to reinvent the wheel but I can fit into something that gives me my time back, but also gives me a good living. It's a no brainer. And I've learned, you know, having spoken to hundreds and hundreds of people a month, you know, everybody's got different motivating factors, haven't they, to do mm -hmm. anything in life, in fact. And, you know, I suppose the art for us is to just to try and understand, you know, what it is, you know, sometimes it is monetary value. You know, sometimes it, it is lifestyle, you know, there's, and there's lots of other things. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, finding the right fit, you know, we, we have to sit down with them and say, look, you know, we're here to help you. But, you know, to do that, we need to know about everything. So tell us what it is. What's your influencing factors? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and sometimes we have to lean them towards 
one franchise rather than another because we know what the influencing factors for the franchisors are. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, if we can't align them, it's never going to work, is it? Yeah. I suppose uh, it's a bit like, you know, you can get a franchise where it's you doing it and you can get a franchise where, you know, we're putting a manager in and actually, you know, a bit like a, I think, is it Pizza Hut franchise as well? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm not going to cook pizzas in there, but I might go, do you know what? I'll run a Pizza Hut and I'll run a KFC and, you know, I'll run this and run. And actually, what you're doing is it's more like investment businesses. In that yeah, case. yeah. In fact, it's it's, a, it's called exactly that. It's an investor franchise. But again, I think that's largely reserved reserved for bigger groups. You know, who mm -hmm. want to open ten to maybe thirty sites simultaneously. I have to say, the market has shifted significantly towards owner operator. It, you know, a franchise or wants to deal with a person that's directly responsible for running that franchise and you know they've got a working knowledge of literally inside that business mm -hmm. so you know they, they know that you know somebody's literally on the ground uh you know running that business but you know like you say sometimes you know you might have a massive site well that can't be down to one person but what it does need is somebody to put that team together and the right team to then roll it out so there's different things for different mm -hmm. types of franchises so Richard, this is uh, this has been fascinating looking at the franchises and and really how they fit, especially for people who are looking to go. I want the leap, but I want the leap into something proven. So Richard, I'm going to just say thank you so much for joining me today. I don't know what's happened to my camera; it's just knocked off there. Thank you so much for joining us, um, Richard. Where do you want people to reach out to you? Um, at any point, you can find me. I've got a fairly unique name, so uh, reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn or reach out to you, Dean, and I'm sure you'd be happy yeah. to forward my details. Um, or my email address is richard at limelicensinggroup.co.uk. So any of those channels, I'm more than happy to talk to anyone, in fact. Yeah, awesome. Richard, you've been a star. Thank you for coming on. Totally unscripted. And guys, do check out Richard on LinkedIn if you're curious about franchising from either side, you want to jump into it or you've got a business you think might go to it. Richard is your man. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks very much, Dean.